Her er ordet til moderatoren for den første debatten, som er Esther Pollack, Stockholms Universitet. So, good morning everybody, and very welcome also from me. My name is Esther Pollack, as you heard. I'm Professor Emeritus of Journalism Studies at Stockholm University, and I will try to moderate this morning. Uh, when this conference was planned, the focus was totally on Ukraine, war, and Russia, and the international consequences of that war. Unfortunately, meanwhile, the Middle East has exploded. The Israel-Palestine conflict is here, and I think it might be very difficult to avoid that some of you probably will say something about that as well. Well, how will this morning look like? A few words. We will start with our keynote speakers, Susan Watkins and Wolfgang Streck. I will present them in a little while. Uh, thereafter, we will listen to short commentaries and reflections from two distinguished discussants, that is Eivind Österu and Sverre Lodgård. And finally, we will engage, try to engage in a common debate. And if the timetable allows it, we will give you the possibility to put a few short questions or commentaries. But as you heard Sigurd say, we have to stop all of it 12.15 sharp. So we will try to keep everything in time. All right, so now I'm very delighted to welcome Susan Watkins. She's our first keynote speaker, and she is the editor of the very well-known, I think, British journal New Left Review. Susan, born in London, trained in literature, uh, co-author with Tariq Ali, a name some of you might know, uh, with him of a book, a very famous book, Marching in the Streets. Some of you might have seen it. Uh, it's a famous global survey of the 1968 protests. She covers world politics, culture and gender issues at the New Left Review. And I think it's worth mentioning, she has been the editor for now 20 years, since 2003. That's amazing. Her title is The American World Order and the Russian Invasion of Ukraine. So very welcome, Susan. The floor is yours. Thank you, Esther. Um, is the microphone OK? Great. Sigurd Alan invited us to this conference many months ago, as Esther has said, to discuss potential exit routes from the war in Ukraine. But since October, it's been difficult to talk only of one war when another is raging and with a civilian death ratio in Gaza of something like five to one, five civilians to one fighter. We should not allow media coverage alone or media-driven emotion to set our priorities for debate. The 24-hour news cycle devoted to the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022 compared to the blackout of Ethiopia's devastating war on Tigray and the Saudi-Anglo-American war on Yemen has already pointed that lesson. The wars for Israel, Palestine and Ukraine are quite distinct, not only in military setting, but in historical character. The one is part of an 80-year battle between a settler colonial state and the population it has dispossessed. The other is a land invasion of a sovereign country escalating from a geopolitical tug of war. And as many have pointed out, the two conflicts are subject to radically different international standards. 
Israel has long had a waiver on the West's universal norms. The rule of law, responsibility to protect, indictment for alleged war crimes and so forth, which are held to distinguish NATO values from the rest, do not apply. Putin's annexation of Crimea was immediately punished by Western sanctions. Not so the annexation of East Jerusalem, the West Bank, or Gaza. As American politicians drop by to advise Netanyahu, and NATO generals explain the lessons they learnt in Iraq about how best to flatten a city, we see every night the brazen disregard of the central principle of the rule of law. Non-discrimination. The same law applies to all. The moral gloss the West had acquired, by contrast to Russian atrocities, has been dulled in a matter of weeks by its support and its active support for the perpetrators of the bloodbath in Gaza. Nevertheless, Gaza and Ukraine do share a formal homology. In both cases, two antagonistic nation-building projects are battling it out. If we are thinking of roads to peace, we need to have some sense of how these countries are being reforged by war, how their national identities are changing, just as those of the Israelis and Palestinians have changed over the course of their conflict. This is not, of course, to imply the existence of such a thing as a homogeneous national identity or some Hedarian essence. But it is possible to speak of a hegemonic national outlook with broadly, if unevenly, shared values, which, in Gramsci's terminology, although they are very likely to express the interests of a particular group, are accepted as the common sense of the community. The role of national consciousness is very different in each case. Israel-Palestine is a national struggle between two people for the same piece of land. And we need to see it as such in order to understand what is happening in Gaza. In Russia and Ukraine, changing national consciousness, a changing perception of the nation, is an upshot of the war. But in both cases, national sentiment and representations of the nation draw upon existing materials on shared historical and cultural experience. So I want to focus on the question of national consciousness and nation formation, but I will also address the other part of my title, the American order. For if Gaza and Ukraine do impact upon each other, although a thousand miles apart, it is via America, which plays a crucial role in each. But I will approach the question of the present international system via a detour through nation formation. To grasp the changing characters of these national sentiments and the dynamics driving them, it may be useful to recall the categories that the Czech historian Miroslav Hroch developed in his study of nation formation. Hroch emphasized first the importance of the world historical conditions in which nations were forged and the social origins of the nationalists themselves. New national movements had first to construct a powerful popular narrative for the community, linking language, custom, and territorial claims to ancient origin stories. Antiquity as a necessary consequence of novelty, as Benedict Anderson puts it, presenting their movement as the reawakening of a long dormant cultural identity. Hrocht dubbed these instances phase A, cultural work, phase B, political agitation, and phase C, state formation. I'll look briefly at how these worked in Israel and Palestine, and then in Ukraine and Russia. The early Zionist movement, the quest for a Jewish home in Palestine, combined a set of contradictory features. 
It was a European-style ethnic national movement with a unique religious basis in an increasingly secular age. A settler colonial project aiming from the start at expelling Palestinians, but with purely opportunist backing from the metropolitan heartlands. In the First World War, Britain and France were already scheming the dismemberment of the Ottoman Empire and their occupation of the Middle East. The British government was anticipating a large war loan and international Jewish pressure for US entry into the war when Balfour sent his famous note to Lord Rothschild announcing its support for the Zionist project. There were also social contradictions. The mass of artisans and petty traders in the small towns of the East, the Pale of Settlement, the territory stretching through most of present-day right bank Ukraine up to Warsaw and Vilnius, acquired by Tsarist Russia in the 1790s, had little in common with the prosperous and semi-integrated Jews of the great cities of the West, let alone the great world financiers. A Jewish cultural movement reviving Hebrew for the modern age had been growing in the East, Hroch's cultural phase A. But Zionism's phase B publicists and organizers were men like Theodor Herzl, the Paris correspondent of a Viennese newspaper. In Hroch's terms, Mandate Palestine under British rule saw phase C of the Zionist national project the beginning of state formation and proto-state forms, the Jewish agency as executive and the Haganah as the military, armed and trained by the British to help crush the Arab revolt. As the Odessa-born Zev Jabotinsky put it, Zionism is a colonizing venture and therefore it stands or falls on the question of armed force. Two further catastrophes marked the character of the nascent Israeli state. First, the Nazi Judeocide endowed the idea of a Jewish national home with imperishable moral force. Second, that truth was immediately conjoined to a crime, the ejection of another people from its national home. In 1948, overseen now by the United States, the Haganah launched its terror assaults on Jaffa, Haifa, West Jerusalem, and scores of towns and villages, forcing the panicked flight of Palestinians, the Nakba. Of the 1.3 million Palestinians within the new state of Israel, 80% were forced from their homes or fled in terror. Israel captured 98% of Mandate Palestine's territory. The other 22%, Gaza, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem, housed the mass of displaced refugees, policed by the British-backed regimes of Egypt and Jordan. The state the Zionists forged was an economic and military success, but its treatment of the Palestinian refugees made it a permanent source of instability in the region. Here, the 1973 war was a turning point for Zionist leaders. In a surprise attack, Egypt and Syria had left Israel reeling as they sought to reverse its gains six years before. Only a massive American military airlift reversed the tide. That moment of vulnerability led Zionist leaders to ask, if their state was dependent on the US for, su for survival, what could ensure Washington's support? Jewish secularization and assimilation was accelerating. The horrors of the Nazi era might fade. In the mid-1970s, the Zionist leadership set about consolidating its American support. AIPAC was expanded into the forceful political machine it is today, exercising an iron grip on Middle East policy in Congress. At the same time, as Peter Novick details in his immensely sensitive and scholarly book, they began a systematic institution-building project to link the Israeli state to Holocaust memorialism. 
On this basis, any criticism of its treatment of Palestinians could be fended off as anti-Semitic. This was one of the most successful ideological campaigns a small state has undertaken. These were external campaigns that did not impinge on national sentiment. But Israel's hold over American Middle East policy would breed a sense of impunity, which did. Palestinian national consciousness was forged from the other side of this process. The First World War and its aftermath brought wrenching changes to Palestine, an overwhelmingly rural society, ruled for 400 years by a few notable families under the distant command of the Ottoman Sultan. Talk of self-determination in 1919 gave way to the jarring reality of British military occupation and the realization that their ancestral home had been offered to others. The dislocations and destitution brought about by the Nakba formed the touchstone for the emergence of a new Palestinian national consciousness, born in the refugee camps in the 1950s. Life in the tent has become as miserable as death, wrote the militants of Fatah in 1959. To die for our beloved motherland is more honorable than this. Shaped by the radical Arab nationalist revolutions and the rising tide of anti-colonial struggle, Palestinian national consciousness took political form, Rochs Phase B, as an anti-colonial <coughs> national resistance movement. Over the next decades, a pattern emerged. The renewal of the Palestinian movement after every de Israeli defeat. Within a few years of the defeat of 1967, when Israel occupied the West Bank and Gaza, there was a strengthening of Palestinian consciousness, a new flowering of poetry and fiction. Emil Habibi's Pes Optimist, Ghassan Kanafani's Return to Haifa, the poetry of Mahmoud Davish, Fadwa Tukan, and Tawfiq Zayad. Politically, the radical group seized control of the PLO, making Arafat its internationally recognized chair. Fatah emerged as a serious guerrilla force. Then again, in 1982, Israel launched its siege of Beirut, killing an estimated 15,000 civilians, helped by the US Sixth Fleet, to force the expulsion of the PLO from the region. Yet within five years, a new intifada erupted across the occupied territories the rising of a new generation who had known nothing but Israeli military occupation. A new layer of intellectuals emerged in the occupied territories as Palestinian spokesmen, Hanan Ashrawi, Mustafa Barghouti, Kassan Al-Khatib, Zahira Kamal. Strategically, the first intifada was the first tactical victory for the Palestinian national movement. But with American help, the Israelis managed to turn the tables by drawing Arafat into a disastrous settlement begun in Madrid and famously sealed here in Oslo. In that process, the PLO leaders gave up on the transition from phase B, political agitation, to phase C, building state forms. Instead, they accepted an Israeli-designed plan the PLO would serve as a police force in the West Bank and Gaza for the Israeli occupation. They would have administrative control over the main pop Palestinian population centers through the auspices of a Palestinian authority. This dead end, with no way out towards a Palestinian national state, would be disguised as a pathway or a roadmap to a two-state solution. A clear view of the present warfare in Gaza needs to start from the fact that the Oslo Accords, Accords brought a fourth catastrophe for the Palestinians after the British Mandate, the Nakba, and the 1967 occupation. Since 1995, Israel has drastically restricted Palestinian freedom of movement, 
sealing off at East Jerusalem, the West Bank and Gaza with military holding pens and checkpoints, with settler-only superhighways bisecting Palestinian land. The PLO's collaboration with the US military has succeeded in casting Hamas, a conservative religious force, I mean, originally a Muslim Brotherhood group, as the more principled force. Anger and frustration at the collapse of national political hopes predictably fueled a return to violence, the Second Intifada, a disaster for the Palestinian movement. Since Oslo, Israel's plan has been to pin the Palestinians down by force, leavened by bribes, in a shrinking amount of land. The IDF siege of Ramallah in 2002, pinning Arafat helplessly in his bombed-out headquarters, made a spectacle of the national movement's plight. Israel was confident that it had Hamas pinned down too in Gaza, with the right measure of bribes and bombardment as administered in 2008, 2012, 2014, 2021, and today. The novelty of on October the 7th was not simply that Israeli military intelligence was caught napping during a bloodier and larger scale iteration of Hamas's previous incursions. As the regional reaction showed, the world context has subtly shifted. The US is suddenly worried that its military emplacements across the region have been left vulnerable to drone and missile attack after its drawdown from the Middle East to pivot to Asia. Its Abraham Accords and strategic architecture were supposed to create a stable security framework around Israel, binding a phalanx of allies against Tehran, against Tehran and Beijing. With Israel's murderous onslaught against Gaza, that has all been put in, on hold. Now, Russian and Ukrainian national cultures might seem much closer. The shared Slavic language, Orthodox religion, Soviet built environment and historical experience. Yet their nation formation processes were opposite. 18th century Ukrainians, like Germans, were typical in having a definable cultural identity, but no continuous history as a political unit. They inhabited a vast stretch of territory, different sections of which were ruled from different capitals at different times. Nor, of course, was this an ethnically homogeneous territory. It was shared with many other groupings, including most of Europe's Jews. The bulk of the region was incorporated into the Tsarist Empire in the 1790s under Catherine the Great, and the peasant population ensurfed under a largely Polish nobility. Under the Russian Empire, the 19th century Ukrainian national movement had a very rich phase A of cultural awakening. But phase B, building a political movement, was impossible under Tsarism. Short-lived secret societies were ruthlessly repressed. From the 1840s, groups of poets, painters, historians, and ethnographers, cut from the same cloth as the wider post-Decemberist intelligentsia, devoted themselves to recovering the cultural history of Ukraine, writing multi-volume histories of its literature and early glories. In the same period that Jewish scholars in the region were resurrecting Hebrew, Ukrainian thinkers were constructing a national narrative founded on the 10th century Kievan Rus and romanticizing the Cossacks, figures of terror to the Jews. But though Ukrainian intellectuals were politically repressed under the Russian Empire, they were not ethnically or religiously repressed. As long as they did not speak of escape from the Tsar's rule, they could play leading roles within the empire's civil and military institutions. The great national poet and painter Taras Shevchenko is a case in point. Born in the Kiev region to peasant parents who'd been in serf 20 years before, a page boy in his landlord's house, freed by an artistic patron, trained in painting at the St. Petersburg Academy and mixing in the most advanced circles there, 
then sent into a crushing 10-year exile for a brilliant and mischievous poem and dying just a little after his return. Only at the turn of the 20th century, after nascent industrialization introduced an insurrectionary working class into the mix and Tsarism began to, lo began to loosen, was it possible for Ukrainian nationalists to organize proto-parliamentary forms, even as they themselves were polarizing politically? But these forms were barely established when, in February 1917, Tsarism was overthrown and with it the Russian Empire. Ukrainian national identity was then caught up in a world historical storm. The Ukrainian People's Republic and the Ukrainian Soviet Republic were successively declared in the midst of war and revolution, foreign occupation and anti-Semitic pogroms initiated by both Denikin's and Petlura's forces. The extraordinary cultural flowering in the 1920s, both Jewish and Ukrainian, was cut short by Stalin's punitive repression and deliberate starvation. In this context, with fascism on the rise in Europe, it is not surprising that new forms of anti-Bolshevik Ukrainian nationalism took toxic forms, including the extreme case of the volunteer battalion of the Waffen-SS. After this 30-year maelstrom, the Khrushchev thaw represented a relatively prosperous period for the Ukrainian Soviet Republic. The opening also offered the chance for the large émigré group in North America to become a factor in Ukrainian politics, a source of moral and material support for Soviet Ukrainian dissidents in the west of the country and for emerging nationalist groupings during Glasnost. During the failed Moscow coup attempt in August 1991, some of these figures seized the moment to vote through a declaration of independence in the Ukraine Supreme Soviet, with the backing of Leonard Kravchuk, a West Ukrainian apparatchik. But these nationalist currents were now operating in a very different international context, with a triumphant American superpower welcoming Eastern states into its military net and an expanding European Union. Independence does not in itself bring a sense of national identity. Ukraine had one of the worst post-Soviet economic collapses. Its state institutions were very weak and soon bought over by the rival clans of oligarchs who ran the political parties. Ukrainian was the official language, but a majority were Russian speakers. It occupied new borders. It was culturally divided. The former Galician lands strongly West identified, the Donbass and Crimea, Russia oriented, and the center essentially multicultural. But the main problems of the newborn republic with its kleptocratic oligarchs and increasingly brutal police state were not cultural, but social and economic. What turned cultural differences into antagonisms and then to civil conflict was the tug of war for hegemony over the territory by outside powers, the US, EU, and Russia, each cultivating their own groups of oligarchs, security chiefs, NGOs, and so forth. There is no need to repeat here the spiral of escalation from the rival bids to bail out Ukra Ukraine's economic crisis in 2013 through the Euro Maiden protests to the visible hand of the US installing the post-Yanukovych government in Kiev, Moscow's annexation of Crimea, the US military advisors guiding Poroshenko's forces to crush the Donbass republics, Putin's repeated demands for a negotiated settlement on NATO expansion, systematically refused by the US, and the high-stakes militarized game of chicken from November 2021 to February 2022, when Putin finally drove off the cliff. What new forms of Ukrainian national identity will emerge from the horrors of the war? How will they recombine the materials of the past? 
a massive economic reorientation to the EU, where most of the refugees have fled, will certainly have an effect. The weight of West Ukrainian culture will surely grow. Volodymyr Yashchenko noted the ease with which political oligarchs, westernizing liberals, Russophobe national, nationalists, and EU-funded NGOs could work together well before the war. A nation whose identity was once made up of differences, East and West, Soviet and post-Soviet, Russian and Ukrainian, which lived the values of multilingualism and cultural difference, runs the risk of becoming far more monocultural. Coercive Ukrainianization, the extinction of labor rights, and sanctification of pogromists like Bandera would have Shevchenko spinning in his grave. The concomitant of the right to national self-determination is the responsibility to protect minorities. On that, the EU and NATO have failed. Now, Tsarist Russia was a prison house of national minorities. In imagined communities, Benedict Anderson argues that a form of official Russian, Russian nationalism emerged in the 1880s as a reactionary response to the popular national movements of its periphery. The state embarked on a fatal Russification policy, pulling the short, tight skin of the nation over the old empire, Anderson wrote. Yet Russian nationalism could not provide the glue for a multinational empire. Rather, it could be a solvent. The Tsarist state was offered by a multi-ethnic elite and demanded dynastic, not national loyalty. In the 19th century, the radical Russian intelligentsia was split between pan-Slavists and westernizers and did not lay the groundwork for a specifically Russian national identity. The Soviet Union reversed the social formula of Tsarism, but it retained the multi-ethnic polity with the promotion of minority languages and cultures. Stalin later proclaimed a Soviet patriotism, which had real content after the Second World War. But it was not until the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 that a semi-formed Russian national consciousness could emerge from its multi-ethnic political shell. It immediately confronted the far more powerful imperial nationalism of the United States, whose global victory over communism had helped give it birth. Since then, Russian state nationalism has struggled to assert itself between the hammer of NATO and the rock of the imperial past. In Not One Inch, Marianne Surratt details the determination of US poli policymakers to fence Russia in, to eliminate it, still the largest country in the world, as a future strategic rival. National Security Advisor Tony Lake in 1993. The successor to the doctrine of containment must be a strategy of enlargement. Strobe Talbot, Deputy Secretary of State. NATO enlargement will, by definition, be punishment or containment of the bad bear. President Clinton in 1994. No outside country can veto NATO expansion. Neo-containment was described by these policymakers as a strategic hedge, an insurance policy. Why? As Strobe Talbot defined American foreign policy, we do what we can in our own interests. Putin's project was, be to, was to be the best behaved of all major states, offering every assistance for the invasion of Afghanistan, consistently backing the US on the UN Security Council, but asking in turn for an agreement that NATO be kept out of the Dnieper region and therefore of Ukraine. When that failed, state nationalism had to rise to the occasion. Putin's history lectures show him inventing a national narrative, much like Hroch's phase A intellectuals. 
Like them, he uses the materials to hand, however contradictory. Kievan Rus, Denikin, Stalingrad. As still an official state nationalism, concocted by Putin and his loyal clique, and not in any way a popular movement, this outlook crudely identifies the nation with the state. On that basis, it was quite logical for Putin to claim that Ukraine had never been a nation. These new forming national identities have implications for the outcome of the war. Through to 2022, a confederal solution with security guarantees along the line of Minsk still seemed the most democratic option. But subjectively, that seems ruled out today. Perhaps the least worst ultimate solution, therefore, would be partition, roughly along the present line of control. In terms of restarting the Istanbul ne negotiations, it's worth remembering why they stopped. In April 2022, Johnson delivered Biden's message that the US would not accept Putin as a negotiating partner. In other words, regime change. So the first key point on fresh negotiations should be, regime change is not a condition. It is for the Russian people to throw Putin out. Finally, how do these two sets of antagonistic nationalisms fit within the American order? When Bush proclaimed the New World Order in 1991, its content had yet to be defined. The diplomatic historian Paul Schroeder argues that a new international system may be declared at a Congress, or as with Bush, in a State of the Union address. But in practice, the meaning of its rules has always been defined through an initial process of struggle. From the Peace of Westphalia through the 18th century balance of power, the 19th century concert of powers, and the 20th century Cold War. For some states, the new order will be highly satisfactory. For others, it may mean insecurity and injustice. For both sides, those defending the status quo and those trying to change its rules, power is the ultimate arbiter. This means a risk for both sides, challenger and defender of the status quo. Do you set limits on how far you'll go to defend or challenge the system? Limits that might concede victory to the other side? Or do you gamble everything and go for broke? In their different ways, these two wars are clearly contesting the meaning of two important but unwritten rules of the American international system. The first rule is what the State Department planners called the neo-containment of Russia lest it emerge as a strategic rival. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is putting that to the test and posing the question of strategic calculus. How far will the US go to defend the system? Will it go for broke? So far, the answer is no. At the outset of the war, the US chief of staff provided a set of limits. No kinetic contact between the US, NATO, and Russia, fighting to remain inside Ukraine's <sighs> borders. And these have essentially been respected. The rate of escalation is slowing. According to the New York Times, American officials fear that Ukraine is becoming casualty averse, while congressional support for financing long distance missiles may be softening. It seems unlikely today that the US will reverse that call and go for broke, enter the war itself, to save the hard reading of that rule. Moscow, by contrast, did go for broke, and in that sense has a strategic advantage, though not necessarily a military one. Perhaps Washington will decide to deal with Russia in some other way, Sanctions haven't worked, but a sustained fall in the oil price might. Hamas's attack and the regional response to it was trying to change the rule that stipulates Israel's continu continuing domination of dispossessed Palestinians. 
Here the US is in a bind. Israel's hold over its Middle East policy has prevented any solution. For any genuine Palestinian state means Israel giving up some of the land it has seized. This it, and so America, will not do. The explosion in the Middle East raises a problem that the US cannot solve, thanks to its tight relationship with Israel, but which will not go away, thanks to the perpetual renewal dynamic of Palestinian resistance. Here, America is more likely one day to find itself going for broke. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. So now, I would like to welcome our next keynote speaker, and that is Wolfgang Streck. From 1988 to 1995, he was professor of sociology and industrial relations at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, USA. And from 1995 to 2014, the director at the Max Planck Institute of the Study um, of Societies, for the Study of Societies in Cologne, Cologne. His research areas are comparative political economy, theories of institutional change, his many writings and books include, for example, the very well-known How Will Capitalism End from 2016. The title today of his speech is The Irresponsibility of Bystanders. Very welcome, Wolfgang. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I still have to get used to the eye operation that uh, apparently restored my vision, but, but I, I do need these glasses. And uh, what I want to talk about is a fundamental... Yeah. What I want to talk about yeah. is, is a fundamental asymmetry in the a uh, new world order in its final stage, uh, which uh, results in two things in both cases. Uh, one is uh, an enormous irresponsibility uh, on the part of the major power of this order, the United States, uh, affecting also countries like ours, of, of the mid of the mid size, uh, giving up on their responsibility to observe uh, the uh, developments in their neighborhood from the perspective of uh, the of the danger of war, and finally, finally the uh, demise of uh, American uh, allies like uh, Israel and uh, Ukraine as a result of uh, the United States uh, both weakness and uh, uh, irresponsibility. Um, both wars were foreseeable not just to the intelligence services of allied uh, Western governments, but to every intelligent uh, observer led by the United States and focused on the short term. What? Yeah, no, no, I, I, I have this here. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, yeah, no. Yeah, no, no, I, 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 <laughs> see God, I was aware of this. Uh, I didn't want to be on this thing all the time, but, but <laughs> I'll show you a few st uh, statistics in, in shortly. So uh, 
uh, Western European countries like ours looked on uh, or applauded publicly when Ukraine adopted the aims that clearly transgressed long known uh, Russian red lines, nobody could be in doubt that this would provoke a Russian response on the ground. In the same way, they looked on as Israel after the Rabin assassination moved away from Oslo uh, use, using the Oslo Agreement uh, to uh, uh, wage uh, what in effect was a war on the uh, Ramallah uh, Palestinian government, systematically making a two-state solution impossible while claiming that the situation in Gaza and on the West Bank that would provoke a Russian response, uh, that, that would, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, was, was under control and would uh, remain to uh, be so. Let me begin with the structural, the, the, the structural root of this uh, international disaster. Uh, and, and this is my first uh, uh, slide. The entrenched irresponsibility of the United States as a major actor. It is vested in this enormous military advantage over the rest of the world. The blue curve is the um, American uh, defense spending, which as you see after the end of the 1990s when there was something like uh, a real reduction, uh, not much, uh, of the uh, military budget. In subsequent years under the, first, uh, under the second Bush uh, American uh, spending increased, almost, uh, almost doubled, and reached a point that was uh, one and a half times as high as at the uh, height point of the uh, Cold War. Uh, after that, a little bit less, but then it continued to increase as they watched the uh, Chinese to begin to pick up, but the Russians were entirely, uh, non, uh, entirely negligible in this, in this context. Uh, this um, uh, enormous military strength uh, was combined with the fact, with, with an enormous geostrategic advantage of the United States, which is it inhabits an entire continent with two oceans, uh, isolating it, uh, protecting it on the west and on the east side, uh, with only two neighbors, or one and a half if you want, because Canada is not really some, <laughs> so much different, uh, and, and Mexico on its southern border, uh, which gives it in all land wars and, and sea wars an absolute enormous uh, advantage Try to imagine after the Iraq war, uh, the United States having lost that war, an Iraqi army uh, marching into Washington DC and demanding that uh, George Bush be turned over to the International Criminal Court uh, in Den Haag. It's totally absurd, it can never happen. Uh, the United States is, uh, cannot be defeated in uh, its military uh, adventures. Uh, right now, the US has 750 uh, foreign, base, foreign military bases all over the world. Uh, Ru Russia, I understand, has four or five, and the same number for China. The Chinese are working hard, to, uh, but, but they have a very long uh, time to go. Uh, this... Um, uh, uh, effective uh, invincibility allows uh, uh, ent enterprising uh, actors in the huge American military and uh, um, intelligence apparatus uh, to invent ever new projects of uh, regime change anywhere in the world. Uh, if they fail, like in Libya, Iraq, uh, uh, Afghanistan, it doesn't, 
affect in any way the United States as a country. They just go. They leave the thing uh, as is and uh, begin and <laughs> embark on a new adventure. Yeah? Uh, but this is something that Ukraine will, will soon experience. And it is also something that might actually, with a little uh, modification, also affect uh, uh, Israel. Let me uh, talk about uh, Israel first. Uh, Israeli allies pretended to believe what the Israeli government had told them, apparently in contradiction to what it itself had heard from its intelligence agency, namely that occasional uprisings by Hamas were inevitable but could be suppressed by operations like cast lead in 28 uh, to 29. Uh, to, to, uh, sorry, to 208, 209, uh, what I call an Alan Greenspan approach to counterinsurgency. You remember Alan Greenspan, who explained to us that uh, crises in the international financial system were inevitable. They would take place every 10 years or so, but we now know how to clean up after them. And, and it was sort of, some of some, something like this uh, that... Uh, uh, contributed to the view of uh, uh, Gaza and the West Bank uh, on the part of both the United States and, the, and, and Israel. Uh, co going back to the US, uh, something that you also need to keep into in, in mind is uh, uh, as another source of its irresponsible behavior uh, is the fact that they have almost no casualties in war. Uh, the, the Vietnam War, uh, basically, it was 1954 to 1973, not, not, not 64. Uh, 58,000 uh, people, uh, uh, Americans, died in the war, which was uh, approximately the number uh, of um, uh, the traffic accidents, deadly traffic accidents in the United States in one year during that period. Yeah. And, and, and many of these were not uh, killed in action. They were killed in, from drugs or uh, traffic, uh, traffic accidents indeed taking place in, uh, in, in Vietnam. In the, Iraq, in, in the Iraq War, 1990-1991, 382 Americans died. In the second, uh, 4,500. And in Afghanistan, during 20 years, just 2,400. Uh, with casualties like this, uh, it is not uh, uh, very uh, painful uh, to uh, lose a war. Uh, so, um, to, to uh, be a bit more specific here, uh, the losses of high-tech and low-tech parties uh, at war um, I, I used some of these, uh, I found some of these statistics. The Paris Commune had what the American uh, military planners call a kill ratio of, of 1 to uh, 27. Uh, 750 policemen and soldiers, roughly 2, 000, estimated 2,000 uh, insurgents. Uh, in the Vietnam War, uh, compared to the 58,000 American dead, uh, it was uh, between three and six million uh, Vietnamese. Uh, it's very difficult to say because the uh, killing technologies that the United States uh, used made it very difficult to find the, uh, the, the dead afterwards. Uh, it, it is a kill ratio of one, fi one to 52 or one to 104. Operation Cast Lead, uh, which I think was continued to be in the mind of the uh, of the American as well as uh, uh, the uh, uh, Israeli military planners had uh, effectively six dead uh, uh, people on the, uh, on the Israeli side uh, and 1,398 on the side of the Palestinians, which is a kill ratio of 1 to 233. And uh, it is... Um, uh, absolutely conceivable 
that this experience uh, was formative for what uh, followed later, the, uh, the Alan Greenspan counterinsurgency theory. Uh, we, can, the, we can always, uh, uh, we, 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 we are always uh, su superior in, in military and technology uh, respects. Uh, so let them, uh, every 10 years, uh, rise up and uh, we will uh, uh, stop them. Latest uh, reports by even by by the by the United by the uh, uh, New York uh, Times uh, yield roughly the following picture. Uh, when we first heard about the uh, uprising in Gaza uh, in on, on the seventh of October, we just couldn't believe that this was possible given the fact that uh, there's no place in the world that is more penetrated by uh, uh, te technological supervalence uh, mechanisms than Gaza. How was it possible that the Israelis did not notice that during these years since caste led, Hamas had built up an army that now is estimated at between uh, 20,000 and 40,000 people, uh, dug out all these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, tunnels, uh, produced these missiles uh, in a world that where nobody could even cuff uh, without the uh, Israeli uh, uh, intelligence service knowing who it was and, and for what reason. Yeah? Um, then, then a few days later, a few weeks later, we had this very strange situation in which, the, in which Netanyahu uh, publicly, uh, uh, publicly uh, berated his intelligence service not having told him uh, what was going on in, uh, in Gaza. A few hours later, he was apparently forced by his deep state to retract the statement and publicly apologize to his services. Uh, the indication can only be that they were actually aware of it, uh, that they <laughs> knew what was going on, but they had adopted this uh, sense of, uh, of uh, invincibility uh, imported from the United States uh, that uh, uh, let them do it, and, and, and then you, you have to make this decision. Do you go in to destroy the next tunnel uh, at the risk of uh, uh, your whole strategy of containment being revealed as uh, very, very dangerous, or just waiting for something? And uh, I think that that was to a very large extent behind what we're, what we're seeing now. Um, uh, now, uh, we can also look at, at kill ratios. Yesterday, um, the, 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 the 1,400 from, from uh, um, October, October 7 uh, are now balanced, uh, if you want, by more than 9,000, uh, which is a kill ratio of 1 to 6.5. There will be more, and it will continue uh, in the, uh, to, to move in the former uh, that, that direction. Um, now, uh, as far as um, Israel is concerned, it is very useful uh, to understand how uh, uh, their military is, 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 is armed. And, and the, the most important uh, is the fact that uh, now uh, CIPRI estimates that they have no, no less than 90 uh, nuclear uh, uh, nu nuclear bombs, uh, nu nuclear devices, uh, with uh, five submarines, which are probably the place where most of these uh, uh, nuclear bombs are stationed. Uh, the, the, the French Force de Frappe is basically a submarine thing, and, and it's roughly the same uh, sort of size. Why? Uh, you don't know where they are. <laughs> And, uh, and if you want to use them as a first, for a first strike rather than a second strike, this is exactly what you, uh, uh, what, what you need. Um, some of the, most of the submarines, incidentally, are, are uh, German, German build and, 
and delivered to, to, to Israel. For the Israelis, the nuclear, the nuclear arms are the uh, essential element of their military doctrine. Uh, while they have 2,200 tanks, uh, planes, uh, 240, uh, so all these wonderful toys, but, but the, 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 the nuclear force is decisive because they always felt to be in, at risk of being surrounded by uh, the rest of, uh, of, of, its, of, of the environment. Plus, uh, always fearing that the United States uh, would, in some uh, situation, uh, uh, not uh, uh, support them. So, um, uh, the United States historically were always against uh, uh, Israel acquiring uh, uh, nuclear arms. And, and uh, this was something, this, this, this guy, uh, Pollard, who, uh, who was the sort of crucial spy uh, for nuclear technology bringing to, to Israel, still sits in prison for, forever. The United States really didn't like that. Uh, so, so in this, uh, which in this particular situation, might actually create an incentive for the United States uh, to, uh, to intervene and, and try to stop uh, this uh, descent into uh, uh, mutual and annihilation. Uh, in, in both uh, cases, uh, Ukraine and Israel, uh, the, the national governments, our government, uh, operated on the fragile assumption that if the worst came to the worst, the United States would come to their assistance, even though the unreliability and irresponsibility of United States imperial policy since the war on terror at the latest was well known. In Ukraine, uh, as Susan man uh, uh, mentioned, the country's Western friends paved the way to a proxy war orchestrated by the United States, although they could have known that the United States is prone to rapidly uh, losing interest in its military invent uh, adventures and to deserting the battlefield when it suits its domestic uh, politics, uh, which we are seeing in Ukraine right now. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the House of Representatives is not going to to fund uh, much more uh, uh, weaponry. Uh, and now the idea is that uh, Europe has to do it, and uh, above all, of course, Germany, because they are the rich men uh, of uh, Europe. And, and the, the United Kingdom will, will also make a contribution. Uh, regarding Israel, uh, Netanyahu's international allies now place their hope in the United States, managing for them the worst international crisis since the end of World War II, with Israel sitting on a big supply of nuclear bombs and in possession of submarines that can serve as a carrier system uh, uh, supplied, as I said, by their uh, 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 European uh, allies. Uh, now, uh, there's no idea uh, of an exit strategy and the day after scenario, certainly not in Germany. Also, it is unimaginable that the German Foreign Office and the German uh, uh, International Spy uh, uh, Intelligence Agency, that they did not know that the situation in Gaza was untenable and could explode at any point. And I will show you. Oh dear. Yeah, this is the wrong file. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, sorry. Uh, I, 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 was, uh, I, I would have liked to show you uh, data from uh, the United Nations uh, International Development Agency, or UNCTAD, on the conditions in uh, Gaza uh, since the locking of, uh, of Gaza 16 years ago. 
the, the uh, uh, deterioration in living conditions, incomes, employment, is absolutely mind-boggling. It is sort of always going down year by year. And uh, to me, it is unimaginable that uh, serious observers of the situation in Israel could not have seen that. Indeed, uh, if, you, if you remember the uh, many visits of foreign heads of state and, and government in Israel, there was not a single one who would have dared uh, his or her picture being taken in front of the wall around Gaza. Uh, I'm sure in their uh, travel documents, they were told by their foreign uh, ministries to avoid this as best they can because everybody must have known that, the world, that, that, that this was a place that would have to explode at some point and then you don't want to be associated with it. They, they were all preying on, I don't know, uh, the, the United States, uh, Israel, anyone uh, to, uh, uh, to prevent this from happening. Uh, and uh, uh, they were uh, obviously unable to, to, to do this. This um, uh, asymmetry in the international system with the United States sort of commanding this overwhelming capacity uh, of military uh, means uh, and the uh, uh, possibility of the rest of the, of, of the world to simply let the United States and their uh, protected friends uh, do their thing in the hope that somehow uh, this will not uh, result in the uh, in, in, in a major uh, conflagration uh, is what I call the irresponsibility of bystanders. Uh, and uh, it affects uh, countries like uh, Germany, um, France, uh, in, in, I would say in particular uh, Germany and France, uh, but also smaller countries like, like uh, uh, Norway, uh, where the governments uh, begin, have only have limited themselves to discussing what sort of arms they are going to send to Ukraine uh, and, and, how much to, uh, and, and how to suppress what, what they call anti-Semitism in their own countries, uh, uh, never, never offering anything like a constructive response uh, to, these, uh, to these awful developments. Now they are hiding their uh, responsibilities behind claims that the Ukrainian war is the result of Russian uh, or Putinesque imperial madness, and the Gaza war, uh, the result of Islamist anti-Semitic uh, madness, the only effective response to both of them being their military defeat, which is what our chancellor calls the Zeitenwende, the turn of the times. Now we are uh, seeing, now there's no prehistory anymore, uh, we, we, are, we are in an ontological uh, condition of uh, uh, existen existential uh, uh, confrontation between enemies, as Carl Schmitt has described them, where there is only one way of dealing with the enemy, that is destroying them. Uh, because we cannot live as long as these people are, are alive, the risk be being that none of us will be alive uh, at the end. Um, thank you. So thank you very much, Wolfgang. Did you forget something? Yeah, I forgot something. I forgot this yes, one. and you might have a seat on the scene, thank you. So, well, we do have two persons here to comment on what we just heard. And I will invite, first I'll invite Eivin Öster for a few minutes of reflections. He is a professor of political science, international conflict studies at the University of Oslo. His research and his writings concern geopolitics and war, sovereignty and nationalism, democracy and regime transition. 
he has held a number of different leadership positions within the academy and is well known, and I think for most of you, you here, of being the leader of the Norwegian Power and Democracy Inquiry from 1998 to 2003. And as I understand it, the most extensive social science project ever carried out in Norway. You might say if I'm right or wrong, but that is what I read. <laughs> so, <laughs> very welcome, Eustin, first. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I take it that I, um, that I stand here um, with the microphone. Is that OK? Can you hear me? Yeah. Very good. Fine. Uh, I'm just going to talk for a very few minutes, uh, some comments on, on the present situation in, in the Middle East and, and particularly in uh, Ukraine. Um, I, I, would, I would like to say first that uh, there are there are uh, some, some very unlikely outcomes to, to these conflicts, and there are some likely outcomes. Uh, I, I can't really speculate on, on, on what it's, it's going to, to turn out, but I can say what I think is most likely as seen at the moment. And, uh, and I will say a few words about that. Some of, of these conflicts have been going on for a very long time. Uh, the Middle East, 75 years. Think about that. It's been going on on and off for 75 years. And there is, frankly, no end in sight. Uh, Hamas, or militant Palestinianism, is not going to, uh, to go away. Uh, Israel will not uh, be able to, to conquer them completely in, in Gaza, whatever they do. Uh, that's not going to happen. Um, the repercussions of, of, of this campaign is going to be fairly, fairly violent also in the future. Yes, that's very likely. Uh, the sev the seven, uh, what's it? 700,000, the 700,000 settlers uh, uh, on the West Bank is not going to go away by peaceful means. That's extremely unlikely. And the uh, IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, is not going to be able to drive them away, whether they like it or not. They were able to drive away the settlers on Sinai. They were able to drive away the settlers in Gaza because they were f f f fairly few. 700,000 uh, with, with, with rather heavy weapons not going to go away. So this is, this is, going, this is probably going, going on for a, for a very long time also in the future. Uh, th there are some, some, some commonalities between, between uh, the Middle East and, and Ukraine. And a common denominator is, of course, the United States. The United States is, as we also have heard, the United States is not going to abandon Israel. That's, uh, that's impossible, also for internal reasons in the United States. They're go not going to, to stop supporting Israel in, in, in the long term. They might stop supporting Ukraine actively. Uh, that's a possibility. If, uh, if, there is a, if there is a change in, 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 in the next presidential election, next autumn, uh, Ukraine might be in trouble. That's, uh, that's one of the possibilities, that, uh, that uh, things will, will, will t be a very different situation just, just one year or one and a half year from now. Uh, but let me say a few words about what I, what I, guess, what I guess is going to happen in, in Ukraine. I think that's uh, it's a sort of it's a topic for discussion. Could be. First, I don't think the, any of the parties is able to win this, more, this war in, by military means. So there is, there is not, that, that's not in sight. Russia might have thought, and there are fairly good intelligence reports about that. They might have thought that they were able to to conquer Ukraine in ten days uh, after 24th of February uh, last year. Uh, they probably had the plan, that's probably true, to, um, to um, make Ukraine a part of, uh, of a greater Russia uh, within the month of August, the same year. And it turned out extremely badly for them. They are more or less in the same position as they were before the attack on the 24th of February. 
uh, consolidating their position in the, in the east, in the eastern provinces and, and in uh, Crimea, uh, but not much more, with extremely heavy, heavy losses. Heavy losses in, in terms of manpower, maybe a couple of hundred thousand soldiers, uh, economic strain, uh, a, f a sort of fortified, consolidated NATO, and two, two new NATO members in, in the West, um, uh, Finland and, and Sweden. So they have lost enormously. Ukraine, uh, the summer offensive, which were sort of hailed as a sort of, this, this could be a breakthrough for, for, for Ukraine with, with Western support in, this, in the early summer. No, uh, a fiasco, really. It didn't, uh, didn't turn out very well. They might have gained occasionally a few square uh, meters, <laughs> not much more than that, but, but it has been extremely unsuccessful. And, uh, and uh, there, is, uh, so there, is, there, is, there is no end in sight in military terms. Uh, negotiations. Russia have a fallback position at the moment. And the fallback position seems to be to consolidate their position in, in the east and to hold on to, to Crimea. That, that's a possible fallback position. Acceptable to, uh, to Ukrainians or to, to the Ukrainian leadership? No. Absolutely not. There was a poll in June, and the poll said that 87% of Ukrainians uh, said that we are not going to give away any uh, piece of land. Not uh, Crimea, not, not in the East. 87%. It's much higher than it was at the beginning of the war, just uh, one and a half year ago. So a negotiated settlement is, is fairly unlikely, as it seems at the moment. Anything unexceptional or anything really unexpected could certainly happen, a black swan or something. But as it looks at the moment, it's very unlikely. And it's also, and, and, what's, uh, not, and, and the, the present intensity of the war, it's also unsustainable. It can't go on, on at, at the present in, uh, level of intensity. Costs are too high. Uh, the, the, the ammunition uh, stocks are, are, are not large enough, even if the Russians are producing much more than anybody have thought just a few months ago. But that's, uh, that's also extremely, extremely difficult to, to have this going on. So what I see as the most likely outcome for, for, for the next few years, longer than that, nobody can really guess, for the next few years, uh, frozen conflict on a lower level, uh, a sort of cutback on, on the support for, for Russia from the Chinese and from, for Ukraine from the United States. But still, they will be able to hang on for, for a fairly long time. Uh, and we will have a de facto partition of Ukraine for a fairly long time. Uh, like many other parts of the world, West Germany after the Second World War, uh, islands in the Mediterranean, this is not unusual. And, and as I see it at the moment, that's the most likely solution. There has even been uh, analysts who have argued that, yeah, but then if you have a sort of de facto partition of Ukraine, the Western part could be part of NATO, as West Germany was after the, after the Second World War in the, in the early 1950s. And we have a frozen conflict for a very, very long time. So what I would like to what I would like to hear from 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 the excellent uh, the talkers in the in the in the first round is a comment on on this fairly gloomy uh, outlooks both for the Middle Eastern situation and for the situation in Ukraine. So let me let's start with that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, our last discussant will be um, Severe Lodgård. And um, he is a senior research fellow emeritus at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, NUPI. You were the director of this institute for many years, between 1997 and 2007. And amongst others, you have also been the director of the UN Institute of Disarmament Research in Geneva, many other positions. And your expert fields 
geopolitics, the Middle East, Iranian foreign policy, nuclear arms control and disarmament, the nuclear programs of Iran as well as North Korea. So please welcome up and we like to hear your comments. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Esther. We have listened to uh, good presentations and uh, good comments by by Eivind. I'm going to hang on to uh, to them and first uh, uh, make a rejoinder to what uh, Wolfgang said about uh, international order issues and uh, the U.S. Uh, power profile in that connection. Mm -hmm. Uh, Biden post postures as uh, the leading spokesman of an international liberal world order of uh, U.S. making. But in essence, um, his ideological campaign is a smokescreen uh, for what is in essence uh, power politics by means of military force and, uh, and uh, economic sanctions. Look at the um, U.S. toolbox. Wolfgang uh, said what should be said about um, military force, military superiority. All serious US presidential candidates have to uh, commit to maintenance of uh, US military superiority. And add to that um, economic sanctions on the basis of uh, US control of uh, the international financial system uh, still intact a huge industry in the United States. And uh, the uh, coercive power is indeed uh, impressive. What I want to add in this connection is that um, uh, this stands out even more remarkably if you look at the rest of the profile. The United States has turned uh, protectionist. And it has given away the free, uh, free trade card um, for free uh, to, the, to the Chinese. All previous US security documents emphasized that free trade is essential for the maintenance of uh, US hegemony. Now that card is, is gone. And if you look at the um, US federal budget, there isn't all that much in that budget uh, beyond uh, military force. The Chinese state is big. Uh, the United States in that sense is small. So when the, uh, when the uh, Chinese minister goes abroad, he might have some uh, billions in his, uh, in his uh, briefcase, while the American counterpart would have to struggle hard to pull together some millions. Gives uh, China, relatively speaking, a big, a big advantage. So it seems that um, for the US to be relevant to the world. The world had better be conflict-ridden and violent. And uh, the Middle East uh, offers uh, a fresh illustration. Uh, half a year ago, when uh, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and uh, China clinched uh, the normalization agreement between the Saudis and the Iranians, the first response from the White House was, we have received reports uh, to the effect that agreement so and so had been, had been uh, uh, made. And then they referred to Saudi Arabia for more information. The United States was sidelined. And that was uh, underscored uh, by what happened uh, the next month. A wave of uh, new contacts and agreements uh, crisscross in the Middle East, uh, stimulated by what happened uh, uh, with the Chinese, uh, Chinese uh, assistance. Um, that was the Middle East on October 6. And on October 7, the US again was uh, uh, relevant all over the Middle East, uh, deploying super superior power to the Middle East, adding to what Israel had 
using the occasion to deploy uh, missile defense uh, systems, uh, Thad and, uh, and Patriot to Saudi Arabia, Patriot systems to Egypt, Jordan, Qatar. The list is, uh, is longer. Again, the United States was relevant uh, all over the region. Now, what I'm saying is not that um, the United States wants the world to be violent. Of course not. But what I do say is that the United States is rigged in such a way uh, that it um, tends to militarize world affairs. Uh, a brief uh, second comment. I'm going to make three. A second comment on, uh, on the uh, situation in Ukraine uh, right now. Prior to the um, spring offensive, Many expected and many more hoped that, um, Ukra that Ukraine, Kiev, would be pushing Russia on the defensive, enough in order to make the Russians interested in negotiations. Whereupon the United States would uh, ask uh, Zelensky to go to the table. That, we know, was a miscalculation. Um, the battlefield is stalemated. Uh, Eivin described it, and this at the time when public support for Ukraine in the United States is diminishing. And I believe that uh, Biden's Republican opponent will try to ride on that trend, steadily uh, growing uh, opposition to more aid uh, packages. And uh, regardless of who that uh, opponent will be. And that is putting Biden in a, in a bind. Because I do not think Biden would like to enter the presidential campaign while Ukraine is still on fire. And uh, the opposition to more aid is, uh, is increasing. So maybe. Um, the table has now been turned around, and the United States would be uh, interested in some kind of uh, interim solution uh, to what is happening in, in, in Ukraine. Uh, in essence, I think the White House would try to find a way of reducing the importance of the Ukraine matter in the presidential campaign. Because what matters most for Biden is not Ukraine, it is not the Middle East, it's not anything else either in the world. What matters most is the presidential campaign, winning that campaign. And so I think we have to keep an eye, a sharp eye, on what is happening in, uh, in the United States in this respect. Third and finally, um, solutions, outcomes. Um, Susan mentioned the Minsk agreement, Minsk II. I think that agreement was motivated on the part of the Europeans uh, out of yeah, buying time uh, for uh, the Ukraine to get better organized and, uh, and better armed. I think Angela Merkel said that much. Uh, Bill Zartman uh, got famous for his thesis about when uh, a war situation is ripe for a political solution, a mutually hurting stalemate with a, with a way out. And a mutually hurting stalemate, that certainly exists. Um, but there is no, and with a way out means uh, something that has been proposed or discussed in the, in the past. Um, but there is no such... Uh, uh, blueprint around, and there are sort of no common denominations. Eivind um, reflected very well on, uh, on, on, that, on that situation. May I just finally take a step back and say that um, there are three approaches, possible approaches, as I see it, um, to uh, when we begin reasoning 
about possible solutions. And the first is international law, to, to um, take it from there. And international law is squarely on, on Kiev's side, up to and including uh, uh, Crimea. Um, but that kind of outcome is far-fetched and uh, doesn't, I think, deserve very much attention today. Secondly, international law is not always good ethics. But if we were to take that as the point of departure, ethics, then I think we should look for a solution which would allow people to live where they feel the most at home. Um, that is not talked about in the West. Uh, any discussion of uh, what that implies is on a tema in, in Kiev. And um, for the Russians, I don't quite know, but for the Russians, certainly what matters most is the, is the state of the, of the state and the empire. Uh, not what happens to, uh, not so much what happens to individuals. And then the, there is the third um, approach, the geopolitical one. Geopolitics uh, stripped of ethics and, uh, and uh, legal considerations. Um, these solutions, possible solutions, would emanate from the situation on the battlefield and the uh, national interests of the main parties. And uh, I understand that um, the main presenters here today uh, also home in on, uh, on geopolitical uh, outcomes of, uh, of some kind. Nice to be here. Um, Good afternoon to all of you. I should have said that in the beginning. I look forward to uh, discussing it all in greater depth with uh, all of you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much for interesting speeches and comments. We might begin, I think, with a question that Eivind Österu said he wanted to discuss. The frozen conflict as a likely scenario. There are probably more scenarios, you've sketched a few of them, but if we could, if you would like to have a word, Susan, what about, what you, is your comment to that discussion? Hmm. Um, it, it seems like that at present, I agree. Um, I mean, it's a frozen hot conflict at present, and if it could cool down and, and become entrenched, I, I think that would be, you know, not a bad outcome at all. I do think that there are many vulnerabilities and sort of hidden crevices in the situation. Um, there's the question of the... Russian military command, which seemed to be very dissatisfied with the war not so long ago. Putin seems to have um, got on top of that. The, the, Russia is extremely vulnerable in economic terms. I, I've been very surprised that the Americans haven't managed to manipulate the oil price down because you know, that worked really well in the 1980s. Um, and so that could still happen. And if oil went down to $30 a barrel or something like that for three years, then the, the, the whole situation would change. I, I've also been surprised um, at what we're currently seeing. And maybe we're being a bit too um, impressionistic about the the idea of a, a stalemate and, and American interest withdrawing. I, I certainly thought earlier on that the America's interest in both Obama and Biden had made such a big deal out of Russia can't do this, you know, we have to uphold the rule of law and so forth. And it seemed to me much more likely that the Americans would escalate and that somehow or other NATO would get involved. That obviously America was going, itself was going to stop short of a direct war with Russia because, I mean, what would they do with Russia if they, you know, but, but um, American uh, noises have pulled back a lot 
from 2022. And I think it's worth bearing that in mind. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it's sort of good um, if America can be rational about this. That, I mean, that's useful for the world, I think. Um, but I, I would have expected them to still to be escalating. So this is a bit of a surprise for me. And, and I do think, I mean, it, you know, other things could explode as well as the Middle East. That many, many other things. The, the Malacca Straits, uh, Taiwan, Iran, the Horn of Africa. Um, uh, there could be some, you know, large political crisis in the United States itself, which is in a, internally in a, a far more, uh, you know, combustible state, I think, than, than it was 10 years ago or so. So um, I sort of hope you're right, uh, a frozen conflict that would, would sort of slowly settle. Obviously, the Korean Peninsula has been a frozen conflict for a very long time, and it, 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 it doesn't have to mean that there's a settlement. Cyprus, Cyprus yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but on the other hand, it's, and it's a, of, of course, it, the uncertainty of a frozen conflict is also a um, humanitarian problem. Uh, for sure, but uh, but the, the role, I mean there are some is some negotiating structure, the Istanbul structure and so forth. Um, the, obviously Putin would have done much better just to go into the east in the first place and not do that sort of putsch attempt on Kiev, which was just completely you know insane. Um, so. It, it, that could happen, but at the same time, there are lots of uh, black swans out there, I would say. Mm. Yes, Wolfgang, let us hear what I, you have to I say. I think the, the, uh, we haven't spoken of China yet. And no. uh, I, I do believe that in these Eurasian things, uh, China is becoming more and more important. Uh, I don't think Russia can make uh, important moves today uh, without being backed by Beijing. Uh, and uh, there seems to be, if, if, if I want to be on the optimistic side, then there seems to be a tacit agreement between uh, the United States and China that the Ukrainian conflict must not uh, issue in a nuclear uh, bombing. Yeah? The, 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 the Chinese are much, much more than the United States on, on the side of... Uh, um, non-proliferation, uh, which is natural for a, uh, for a nuclear power. Uh, you, you don't want the others to, uh, to also have these uh, little toys. And, and so uh, uh, my impression from talking to people, especially in the United States, was that there, there, there is some sort of tacit understanding. The, mind you that uh, and everything you read on this in the newspapers is sort of invented, censored, <coughs> <and> so, nothing. <coughs> Nothing, not, there's nothing uh, spontaneous. But, but the, the American government, the White House used to spread this story that in the, in the war room of the White House, uh, uh, Biden put up a little poster uh, uh, with the inscription, uh, no World War Three. That's good news. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. If it's, if it's full news. If, if it is true. If, uh, if it is true, this, this, but but <coughs> release it for a purpose, and and I think, um, the, the, and, and I think this issue of, of of nuclear war has to be brought into the discussion also, as I try to, uh, in the in the in in the Middle East, the the uh, uh, the Israeli government is a uh, uh, how how do you say um, a, a wild cannon or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. O on this issue, on this issue, the the Israeli nuclear force is invented or is uh, was built built up against considerable resistance uh, in the United States as a uh, weapon of uh, last resort uh, in case there is a surrounding uh, of Israel by its Arab uh, uh, enemies, and and in order to. Uh, prevent uh, this situation in which Netanyahu 
uh, sort of pulls out these things. I think that the United States, I, 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 to me, the fact that the United States are now sort of uh, circling, uh, uh, circling uh, Israel like, like mad, talking to all of these governments, has something to do with the fear that uh, in an uncontrolled moment, uh, Israel will pull out these things. Yeah? Even if they just mention them. Not, in none of the Netanyahu speeches have uh, uh, Israeli uh, nuclear bombs been mentioned. Yeah, the, but simply, sim, I, I mean, she, uh, the, the Chinese uh, uh, guy, uh, they, has even put an injunction on Russia uh, speaking about nuclear arms. Uh, a few months ago, Putin, in one speech, mentioned that he had all, also these uh, uh, things in his backhand, and and uh, the day after. Uh, the, the Chinese said that even threatening the use of these things cannot be allowed. Yeah? Yeah. So, so let me be a little bit uh, more optimistic than Susan, although this is not my nature. <laughs> <laughs> means you be a little bit more optimistic and, and say that once these ultimate means of destruction appear in the strategic calculation of any major actor, the world may change. A little bit, but may, a little bit to the better, perhaps. Oh, okay. So, Eustin. Eivin. Eivin. <laughs> Thank you so much. Just a, just a, few, a, few, a few comments. I, I agree completely that the 24th of February last year was a gross miscalculation by, by the Russians, for sure. They should have settled for what they had. <laughs> they could come fa fairly reasonable control of the eastern provinces and control of uh, Crimea, mm. um, definitely. Uh, as for as for China, I agree completely. China is extremely important. Uh, China has uh, no interest in this war. They would prefer that uh, there was some sort of solution. Um, they have no interest in a war in the Middle East either. They have uh, come into the Middle East recently with uh, fairly strongly. Uh, with, with the negotiated uh, f f ceasefire between, between in, 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 uh, in the southern part of, uh, of, of Arabia, and with, with, with between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, and uh, and they, have, they have also increased their trade with, uh, with the Middle Eastern countries to, to a great extent. And they are not alone. There, is, uh, there, is, there was 35 countries who did not vote in, in, the, in the first couple of, uh, of uh, uh, votes in the United Nations in, uh, in uh, late February, early March last year. Um, more than half of the world's population in these 35 countries, uh, like India, China, many others. Uh, many of the others who voted for the resolution, uh, said that Russia should withdraw, are not part of the sanctions. They, they trade more with, the, with Russia now than they did before. So substantial parts of the global south has not taken a stand. They are hedging, they are sort of spreading the risk. They, are not, they don't want to be involved in this because they, 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 they have no interest in, in, in the complete Russian defeat and they have no interest in the war and they don't like to, to take a stand. That's, that's the substantial parts of, of, of the world population, more, just much more than half. Mm. So, so, so and that's an important factor in, in these terms. Let me just <coughs> have, a, have a very small comment on, on what uh, Wolfgang said on, on, on the uh, Hamas attack um, on the 7th of, uh, of October. I agree, it's amazing that Israel didn't discover it beforehand. It's amazing because after the war with Hezbollah in 2006, they um, restructured uh, the IDF. They concentrated more on, on hybrid warfare, yeah. on, on guerrilla warfare, they, as they had, where, where they had been trapped in South Lebanon in, uh, in, in, uh, in the summer of, of 2006. And they should have foreseen this. The reason, the, the only reason, the only explanation is that Hamas communicated on a sort of uh, pre-electronic basis. Mm -hmm. They used uh, paper, pieces of paper, personal communication, and, 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 and there they took advantage of the sort of compact area 
on Gaza. It's a very compact area. Mm. That's, of course, a disadvantage in military terms. They are extremely vulnerable, as we see at the moment. But on the other hand, it makes other types of sort of non-electronic communication possible. And that's probably the, the only possible explanation for this, that it was possible to, to take Israel by, by a surprise attack on the 7th of October. I, I, I see no other explanation. No. And while the right-wing government in Israel was very occupied... Yes, they, they, they well, occupied on the West, on the West Bank. Bank. They were occupied yeah. to defend the settlers on the West Bank. <coughs> and they had, they had sort of, sort of their, their, their agenda were, was, was different yeah. because they didn't, they didn't really sort of notice this properly. Sverre, mm. you wanted the word. Joe Biden handled the um, Ukraine portfolio under Obama's reign. Mm. And he was known to be particularly hawkish on uh, Ukraine. Yeah. And he seems to remain so. Mm. Today he is fighting for um, another assistance package, more than $100 billion, border defense and the Middle East included. Uh, we'll see about that. But I think it is a safe bet that while he's fighting for that aid package, the White House is doing uh, contingency planning as best they, uh, they can in order to remove uh, the uh, Ukraine issue from the um, uh, campaign agenda as much as, uh, as possible. Um, and what comes to mind then <laughs> as uh, uh, an obvious uh, sort of first option is precisely what you talked about, um, um, a, a cold peace, yeah. a cold peace of, of some kind. So um, we should not be surprised if something of that actually happens in a not so distant uh, future. And then secondly, I beg to disagree with Wolfgang about uh, the Middle East and nuclear weapons. See if I can uh, make you more comfortable on, on that one. Um, the only context, Middle Eastern context, in which that would be uh, in the slightest uh, you know, imaginable uh, would be the Iranian uh, Israeli context. And um, the uh, Israelis do not have in mind, it seems, to use this opportunity to attack Iran, uh, in which case, uh, again, the use of nuclear weapons would not be on the agenda. Uh, we know that uh, Israel has uh, asked for US participation in, uh, in bombing of Iran uh, on uh, several occasions in the past, for instance, in 2008, when um, uh, Bush's son uh, said that this was not on his agenda for the rest of his time in the, in the White House. In 2009, end of nine, Obama, uh, he decided uh, to uh, give the green light for a cyber attack on the facilities in Natanz, producing uh, enriched uh, uranium, uh, because he was concerned that the Israelis could do it alone if uh, the US was not willing to participate. Um, so that you know, scenario is, uh, is always there, uh, that a, uh, an attack, uh, a bombing of Iran to stop their nuclear ambitions uh, might happen. But even on that scenario, the uses of nuclear weapons uh, uh, are marginal. Uh, I can see only one target in Iran that uh, uh, would call for nuclear weapons, and that would be the facilities outside the holy city of Qom, Qom um, which are so deep into the mountains that uh, conventional arms uh, could not, uh, would not do. Uh, that is on the margin uh, a possibility, uh, but uh, we are not anywhere near uh, that eventuality uh, today. Yes? Even <laughs> a, a, a short comment on uh, on uh, nuclear arms, which of course is this is really scary background to the uh, Ukrainian war. It, it has been mentioned by Putin several times that be aware that we have nuclear weapons. Uh, of course, that it hasn't been used. It's also we're talking that that the deterrence works in a way. He knows that if 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 there is a nuclear exchange between between Russia and and, and, and the West, uh, the United States it will be complete disaster also for Russia. Uh, tactical nuclear weapons. Um, the, the paradox of the Ukrainian war is that on the one hand, it's a very sort of high-tech warfare uh, with drones and advanced missiles and so on. 
On the other hand, it's extremely old-fashioned. It's, it's nearly similar to the First World War. Trench warfare. You can't, you can't use nuclear weapons in the trench warfare, where you have sort of, where, where sort of there, are, there are just a few kilometers or a few hundred meters between, between uh, Russian and Ukrainian forces. It's, it's, it's impossible. It, is, it isn't a terrain for, for the use of tactical nuclear weapons, even if you would, would like to do that. So, so that is also a barrier in, 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 uh, in the Ukrainian war. And, and, and that is why this hasn't really come, come true so far. As, as for, for Middle East, I, I, I think I agree with Sverre. It's, um, it's only in, 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 in context with, uh, with a full, more full-scale war with Iran that this is, that this is likely or possible. But, but yes, Wolfgang. Even, even, that is, even that is fairly scary in the long term. Yeah, <laughs> it is scary. Yeah, sure. I, I don't, the, but, but Sven knows so much more about this. Uh, what, what I notice is that uh, uh, Germany has this sort of treaty with the United States on, on nuclear participation. We are now buying uh, 35 F-35s from the United States that uh, can carry, uh, uh, on, if only for the purpose, of carrying nuclear bombs uh, on the uh, advice, quote unquote, of the United States. Yeah? Because the United States tell, tell us where to drop them. And then, well, what I know, then, then I inquired what, 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 sort of, uh, what sort of use do they have in mind for this? And it turns out that there are very sophisticated battlefield uh, uh, nuclear, nuclear arms today. And that much of what these um, uh, fighter bombers are actually training, uh, what, what they are practicing, is to attack uh, uh, concentrations of uh, uh, military uh, forces in the hinterland of the, of the enemy. Uh, so, so if you have like 10,000 10, troops sort of <laughs> moving, moving forward, uh, then you run the risk that one of those planes comes that, that flies sort of two meters above ground <laughs> and then they go up and at this point uh, they, they release the bomb and the bomb goes like this and they go like that. And, and that, that's what they practice all the time. It m makes me uh, uh, think uh, what, what they actually have in mind. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> very, very briefly. Uh, they are training on, on missions uh, which uh, I, for one, uh, uh, believe uh, are not credible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think the security assurance, uh, uh, the US security assurance uh, for Europe is at all credible. And I maintain mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And we have been there for a long while. Henry Kissinger in 1979 told the Europeans not to ask for assurances that we mm -hmm. could not possibly give. Mm -hmm. But uh, still, uh, they, they keep, uh, they keep, uh, they stick to, to this doctrine and they mm -hmm. practice these, uh, these missions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. <laughs> right. Yes. I, I just I'm curious. I have a question to to the to the main speakers. Yeah. Uh, it concerns the uh, the, the Middle East. Um, it, it seems to me that one of the one of the big obstacles to to a sort of lasting peace or lasting ceasefire, at least the ceasefire in the Middle East, is is the settlement policy on the West Bank. That's 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 crucial. On the other hand. That seems to be with 700,000 militant settlers. It seems to be completely irreversible, mm. um, and and uh, and uh, and and that means that you you don't really have you don't really have the prospects for a stable solution with a as a, as a two-state solution. Do you still think that this two-state solution is viable, or or or, or don't you think that? I'd like to hear your opinion on this. Yeah. I, am, I am extremely skeptical when I hear this. It's, yeah. uh, for me, it's, it 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 sounds like sort of some some very sort of lofty diplomacy. It's not. It's really not going to happen. But that's mm. my sort of hunch feeling. I would yeah. like to hear about. Yeah, I I think all the discussion of a two-state solution at Oslo um, was a a smokescreen. Really, yeah. um, they they weren't. They were just getting the Palestinians to go along with giving up on, on a, a two-state solution. The one-state solution, um, which was one of the PLO's official positions um, in the 70s, it was always the position of the sections of the Israeli left and the Communist Party there. It, it, um, in principle, logically, 
um, it's <laughs> a, a binational state for, um, for, for both populations is there. I mean, it's further away than ever, obviously, with um, after October the 7th. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's a third option, which is the Israeli option, uh, which is continued expulsions. And I think that's what Biden is doing when he's going around to Jordan and um, Egypt. I mean, Blinken tried very hard and was, it was obviously the timing was wrong. Jordan unbelievably refused to meet with Biden when he was over because they don't want to, didn't want to be associated with helping more population expulsions. But I mean, that's definitely the Israeli plan. Ben-Gurion's famous statement, maximum land, minimum Arabs. In practice, it breaks down slightly differently, I think, or it, it has done historically. Maximum land holds, but they would rather have the land and have Arabs in it than um, give up the land. So I think, you know, they, they'll, they think they can expel the Palestinians at some later time if they're there. So it's maximum land and minimum pa Palestinians eventually is, is, I think, what they seem to be operating on. But, I mean, that's definitely what's, what they're pushing for, whether, you know, Egypt will take more uh, refugees, it, I, it depends how big the bribe is, I would say. But on the other hand, the Palestinians have a very high consciousness about this. And they, I mean, remarkably, they, they haven't really, I think, given up on the, um, you know, their, their national idea. Hamas, in a sense, does, because that is a religious group, not a national group. Yeah. And what they want is a pan-Islamic uprising a across the region. That, that's what they see, rather than having a, a strategy for a, a Palestinian home. And I, I, th I think one should also say that the Palestinian... Well, two points. The Palestinians have suffered from terrible strategic leadership on this question. When they, you know, at the end of the first intifada, when they had a great deal of moral capital internationally. They were very much associated with the um, position of anti-apartheid campaigners in, in South Africa and so forth. They could have, um, you know, fought seriously. And some of the people at, at Madrid, I know um, Rashid Khalidi and so forth, did try to really put an argument for a state as opposed to for, for the you know, policing settlement. But it was vetoed by Arafat. And, I mean, it, it, similarly, Hamas does not have a national strategy for the Palestinians. It, it's, it's just this set the Middle East on fire. It doesn't, it doesn't have any institutional um, logic. Time is so, running out. Okay. So. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and did you want an yeah. answer, short answer from Wolfgang, or...? Yeah, I would like a uh, very short comment to, to say yeah, from that, yeah. but still, yeah. yeah I, I only have this question. Je Jeffrey Sachs, who I c consider one of the more um, uh, intelligent um, uh, people on the, on the peace front, yeah, uh, recently sort of speculated on the possibility that the five powers of the, of the uh, uh, UN uh, Security Council could, on this issue, uh, cooperate with each other to try to enforce uh, something like a viable two-state solution. He does not mention in this piece uh, the question that you are raising, namely what can happen on the, on the West Bank mm. with the uh, Israeli uh, settlers. Mm. But uh, I, I would wish so much uh, that in the, in the view of the enormously destructive possibilities uh, that that uh, are, are uh, given with this conflict, uh, that maybe uh, uh, the United States co could be willing for the first time to accept uh, a constructive contribution uh, from especially China, uh, because China is the power that would be important here. They would bring Russia along, and France and Britain would have nothing to say. Mm. Mm. Right. 
Just, just, a, just a, a short comment on, on this question of, uh, of Hamas. Uh, I agree, it's, uh, it's basically a religious movement, not a national movement. Uh, they must have calculated that uh, a surprise attack on Israel would lead to a violent counterattack, counterattack by Israel, and that this would sort of lead to a more violent uprising in various parts of, uh, of, of the area. Mm. Certainly, that must have been a calculation. The, so far, they didn't seem to have succeeded. Hezbollah is, is amazingly mm. tranquil on, on, on the northern front. They haven't gone to, 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 to an attack like what they tried in, in 2006. Uh, there, is, uh, there is no attack on Israel from, from Syria, from the, from the sympathizers of Hezbollah in, in Syria. Uh, Iran has been sort of fairly reluctant to engage heavily in this. So th there must have been some sort of miscalculations, at least as it looks so far, also from, from, from Hamas' side in this. Would, would, would you agree on this? Yeah, they've got the Houthis. Yeah. That's, that's not saying very much. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's right. And I, but I think also um, there the keep being sort of trailers that Nasrullah is going to make a speech. And, you know, um, I, I don't know whether that's going to happen. But I, I think one thing that's quite important is that those groups really... I mean, Hezbollah decides for itself. It's not, it, you know, decisions for it are not taken in Tehran. Obviously. Um, yes. And... Uh, and They've obviously, um, you know, the collapse of the Lebanese banks and of the Lebanese economy and mm. so forth has hit them very hard as well. Mm. Um, they they need to calculate whether this is the right moment for them. So no, I I think that that's possibly right. That um, okay. I'm so sorry. Dear public, excuse us, but this is such an interesting uh, debate, and as you understand, we could go on and go on, and maybe we will, but I have to shut it all down at 12.15 sharp. Just a second, I want to thank you all, and I think you've given us a lot of things to think about, and a lot of themes that we do not meet very often in the public debate, which is a shame. Um, because we, I think, should. But before you leave, so I want to say thank you, Susan. A little bit of Norwegian culture for you as well, and for you. You will not get the... Well, you will get sort of a Norwegian culture as well. <laughs> you could say that. <laughs> but another kind. <laughs> so, a, an applause for all of them. <laughs>